The world of learning must be illuminated by a festival of lights, a festival to which every race brings its own light. The whole world suffers if even a single race is left out of it, said Rabindranath Tagore. And our next speaker comes to us with precisely this message of peace, all the way from Shantiniketan. Dr. Uday Narayan Singh, Pro Vice Chancellor at Vishwa Bharati, Shantiniketan, is a multifaceted academic, a poet, playwright, a linguist, and at present working on a compendium of Tagore's works. He has recently participated in several seminars all over the world, including Dhaka in Bangladesh, and he brings to us the soul of Shanti Niketan to the Smithsonian through for all Washingtonians and across the world. Please welcome Dr. Uday Narayan Singh. Thank you, Manjula, and thanks to all of you who have assembled here to celebrate creativity. Some of what I would say or I would show would be repetitive, would perhaps have already been covered by others before me, and I neither have the erudition of Dr. Uma Das Gupta nor the poetic imagination of William Radice to do justice to be coming after them. But let me still try and give you some bit of Shantiniketan to all of you who have assembled here as Smithsonian. Special greetings to the virtual audience who are listening to us from wherever. The story of uh, making of a legend um, is divided into seven sections. And I begin with the section on peace. And you have some of the visuals at times, what I will say would not necessarily match with the visuals that I show, but you have the choice of listening to me as well as watching the visuals. The question that I begin with is about peace, on which Tagore had to say so much, especially on the following issues that I would like to raise. Does peace bestow new life? Or does it appear after death when there is a tranquility? Could peace be brought about by words and action? Or words and action that we have seen invariably before all the wars and battles are there as strategies only to delay the battle, only to delay the action? Does peace come in silence? Because quite often, Tagore says that more than what you can speak through words, you can perhaps say without the words in silence. More than what you can read into the words, perhaps you can read between the words. Is peace a response to myriads of questions that we would like to raise? Or does it create an environment where ideas germinate? Could peace be confined to four walls or Niketana? Shanti Niketana is the name which is given to the space that he created, an abode of peace. Now the dilemma that Tagore had, had to do also with, can we wall a space? Should we wall a space? Or should it be without the walls? Should it be Niketana or Aniketana? I would particularly draw your attention to the great Karnataka poem, poet, Kuvempu, a lover of Tagore, who talks about Aniketana. If you look at the, the, the national poetry that Kanadigas always uh, know, quote from Kuvempu, it, it sings the, in praise of the Aniketana, that is the seamlessness. And I think in Tagore's work, it is this seamlessness within the walls which is tried to be captured. Shimar Majya Oshim is particular lines that I would like to refer to. 
And in this context, let me quote from Tagore, and particularly his poem from Gardner. Peace, my heart, let the time for the parting be sweet. Let it not be a death, but completeness. Let love melt into memory and pain into songs. Let the flight through the sky end in the folding of the wings over the nest. Let the last touch of your hands be gentle like the flower of the night. Stand still, O oh beautiful end, for a moment and say your last words in silence. I bow to you and hold up my lamp to light you on your way. This few slides that I'm going to show you are basically lighting the lamp into the life and the creation of Rabindranath Tagore, about whom Burton Russell, the philosopher, had quite rightly stated, he has contributed as much as any man living to the most important work of our time, namely the promotion of understanding between different races. And that's where I think his contributions come. The slides that we have seen from Dr. Numa Dasgupta's description of how the barren land became Shantiniketan also shows that he was, in a way, recreating nature. And the beginning, we have all been told how, how the family had started, so I'll skip this slide. But important thing is that in, 19, in 1873, while traveling to the Himalayas, his father brought him to this space, which, is, which was a barren land at that point of time, and yet beautiful, from the, uh, which was bought from the zamindars of Raipur, Birbhum. And today, if you look at the, the total uh, you know, topography of the whole space, this is where Shantiniketan is located, 180 kilometers from Kolkata, and this is what we have already seen in Umadi's presentation, how it was. And if you look at the satellite picture, it's a very green area, even today. Um, this is the image of the core area of, of Shantiniketan and Sriniketan. When Rabindranath was being brought by his father through the train, the first train journey that he had undertaken, and let me give you a hilarious quote from there. And he was warned by his, by his, uh, by Shotto, Shotto Boliya Chilo, Bishish Dokkota Nathakile, Rail Garite Chorak Bhang or Shankot, Paphoskaya Gele Yar Rokkanai, Tarpor Garijokon Cholite Armbo Kore, Tokon Shurire Shomosto Shokti Ke Asroy Korea, Kub Jor Korea Boshachai, Nohile Amon Bhano Dhakadai, যে মানুষ কে কোথায় ছিটকাইয়া পড়ে তাহার স্মৃতি পাওয়া যায় না from jivan smriti he writes about the, the dangers of traveling through the train and how you should really survive as you as you travel through the train and he goes on uh, talking about uh, this and he says describes the various beautiful natural images that he has seen through the windows of the train gari chutiya cholilo Torusini Shobuj Nil Pardava Bistirno Mart Ebong Chayachonno Gramguli Delgari Duidhare Duichobi Jornar Mato Bege Chudite Lagilo Jano Morichikar Bonna Bohia Chuliace. What a beautiful expression to describe the nature all around you as you watch through the windows of the train. But most important thing what I would like to point out here is what he does as he reaches Bolpur. He closes his eyes. He doesn't want to see Bolpur. He doesn't want to see Shantiniketan in the darkness. He wants to see it in the morning light. So he says, Shantar Shomai Bolpur Punchilam, Palkite Choriya Chok Bujilam, Akibare Kal Shokale, Bolpur Shomosto Bishoy, Jagrota Chokhe Shomuke Kulia Jaibe, Eyamaricha. So the romanticity with which he approached. Bolpur and Shantiniketan could be very evident in the way he describes in his Jivan Sriti. I have given this piece of painting from Tagore's own imagination and I have renamed it 
audaciously as a nature in the morning light as Tagore saw it. Because I'm sure there's something like this that he has seen uh, and he was waiting for this to be seen as, as, as he would open his eyes. And if you're looking for seasons even now, I think uh, you have all the good reasons to come to Shantaniketan because I don't think the big cities, the metropolis in various parts of India would really be able to preserve all those seasons. Whereas in, in Shantaniketan, you can see the rains, you can see the winter, you can see the summer. And this is an important thing that it is these seasons which you would like to which we would like to invite you to see. And in this context, let me quote the invitation to nature, which is a translation by Ketuki Kushari Dyson from Tagore. The night is black and the forest has no end. A million people thread it in a million ways. We have trysts to keep in the darkness, but where or with whom of that we are unaware. But we have this faith that a lifetime's bliss will appear any minute with a smile upon its lips. This was the Shantanikatan Griho. We have been shown a few moments ago where young Rabindranath came. This is what is the, another archival image. And if you look at the restoration part that Ambassador Singh has talked about, after restoration it looks like this today. Uh, of the 27 buildings and the lake, 17 have been completed. On other 10, we are still working. This is what uh, it was also when Tagore himself standing in front of the building, another archival picture. And next to that is the Chatim Tola, where uh, Devendranath uh, prayed, which is very crucial in the life of Vishwabharati and Shantiniketan, the marble platform on the Chatim Tola. The Upashana Griho, which you can see, uh, the non-denominational prayer hall, where uh, you have all different kinds of, uh, you know, religious ceremonies which happen, including Krishtotsab. Um, the Upasana Griho is always full with people. We have students, faculty members coming, and also people from outside, visitors, tourists, as well as ashramics who come and throng this space. You can imagine this, uh, how it will look like. Um, this was an archival image of Upashana Griho. The, uh, the structure which you see next to Upashana Griho has fallen down. It's no more there. But it's in the lake, uh, which was used to be a lake next to the Upashana Griho, which is no more there. But uh, I'm told it is there, submerged there. And this is the uh, nature school, Patubhavan, about which we have seen some images earlier, Tagore himself teaching. The students are in different parts of the school. The important thing that I quote here from Tagore is about the mind of the child, where he says, the mind of the child is always on the alert, restless and eager to receive first-hand knowledge from Mother Nature. Children should be surrounded with the things of nature. In fact, what's important for, for us to remember that when he's talking about education and child education in particular, his, his basic principle that he begins with is the child will learn anyway. And all you do is to, to supply the child with a nice environment, with a kind of uh, you know, facilities of language, of creativity, so that the child grows in a certain right kind of way. This is the Patobhavan in initial days, another image of uh, Brahmacharjasram and Shingha Shadon of the Patabhavan opposite to that. Uh, you have the, uh, the whole thing is located, as you can see in the uh, image that I have shown you with the arrow there in the entire spot. This is the fuller image of the Shingha Shadon and uh, Poschim Toron. The original space where they lived, the students lived, is also given here, Prak Kutir, in 1902. The other images that I've shown here are the images where Tagore lived or where others uh, uh, who were associated with Tagore live. And some of these uh, you would recognize if you've been to Shantinikatan, Taludhaj, and Deholi. Deholi is a space uh, built in 1904 where Tagore lived for a short while. 
and the, the whole ashram area looks like this. Now, today, the Udayan Griho, which is in the Uttarayan complex, um, would appear to you like this if you're looking at it from the garden side. And if you're looking at it more closely, within Udayan Griho, you have various images of Udayan here. Uh, the outside, the inside hall where a lot of meetings, events took place, this uh, sitting room, and on the rooftop, and the pampa lake behind Udayan Griho can also be seen. Some of the other images that I've shown here is, uh, would be Ghontagha, would be Guhaghor and Chitrabhanu, uh, associated with Rathindranath Thakur and Pratima Devi. Um, other houses on the Uttarayan complex, the Konark, the Udichi, the Punascho, and the Porishishto. A lot of visitors who come here ask us this question about uh, why do we have so many houses and why did Tagore live in so many houses? I think this is perhaps uh, quite justified. And if you look at his, look at his uh, anxiety, look at his dissatisfaction, look at his uh, ever, ever growing creativity, uh, that he would really uh, would look for something new. Uh, everything, every time that he would achieve some great uh, text, he would write up some great text or compose some great song, he would always try for something new. And this is true also of his, of his buildings. And of course, uh, there are other creative people like Shuden Kaur uh, and people who decorated some of these buildings uh, like Nandulal or Abun Tagore, who were also there. And uh, therefore, they would create spaces for him where he, his mind would work in a very fertile manner. If you look at the space here, where he would sit there and either read poetry or write poetry, or talk about uh, various issues with others in the ashrama. This is the Shamuli house, about which uh, he had written to Andre Karpeles, the painter friend. Shuren has built for me a mud house, a mud casket beautifully worked for enshrining in the last few days of my life. All our dwelling places contain varied partnerships of love, but this last one of mine will only offer me a perfect solitude of a final departure, which will not have the time to allow life's trespassers to invade its loneliness. And he's st seen standing in front of Shamuli. Um, when Vishwabharati came alive during his time, there was a participation all around, participation of the students, of the faculty members, of everybody who was around there to create this. And some of this can be seen in these paintings here or in the murals and in the in various sculptures that come around the, the space, the, uh, Kalo, uh, the, the uh, Kalobari that you can see here. Uh, when it, is, it was being made, this is how it was being made, and this is how uh, it, it got constructed. And various other spaces are, are still there where you can see murals um, in abundance, including the new one which Vanida had created on your right, you can see this uh, new one. Uh, so this is really evolved, and uh, I would say that in Vishwabharati and Shantaniketan, the way he had created and conceived of it, his, his main purpose is to underscore the point that it is important to make a connection between uh, the human beings and the, and the sublime. And his main goal, I would say, was the divinization of man and humanizing the divine. The humanizing the divine is something which is got from the bowels, and it is something which, is, which comes repetitively in, in the various bowel uh, songs and in the refrains. And he extended this only when he uh, tried creating the, the practical application of many of the things which he has seen in different parts of the world, particularly in America, and in the Srinikatan initiative that he had seen, that he had shown us, he had, uh, he had tried doing that. So Shilpa Shodan or uh, Polli Shangathan Vibhag or various other activities of Sriniketan um, connecting with the rural uh, reconstruction and extension services that is building bridges with various villages around, about 30 to 40 villages which have been really connected with Sriniketan by, by associates of Tagore at that point of time. And I've, I've just given you some images because uh, I, I was asked to bring in as much images as possible for those who have not visited Shantaniketan, for them to see uh, those images 
so that they get tempted to visit Shantaniketan here. And this is the mural which you can see, Holocaustian mural, which you can see in the Srinikatan. And the actual Holocaustian you can see uh, on, the, on your right. So these are, these are many, of these, many of these events that Tagore created are connected with rural life, connected with seasons. And that, I think, is very crucial um, because these are not, these are not uh, uh, things which would normally be thought about by somebody else because usually in educational institutions elsewhere, wherever we have seen, they depend on the, on the calendar, which is a cultural calendar, whereas Tagore created his own calendar, which is based on the nature. I think that's the crucial thing which one must underscore. Uh, while concluding this uh, presentation, I would say that the most important thing about Tagore was the belief in one's own self that we can do. Uh, something which has made President Obama but very popular here, yes we can. You can see <laughs> the genesis of that long ago where Tagore had underscored the importance of the self-reliance and the self-belief, the intuitive knowledge and the inner strength. These are very important. And to be able to do that, to be able to achieve that, it's important that we do not always move in terms of the logic and science. Of course, very important logic and science, but a mind all logic is like knife all blade. It makes the hand bleed that uses it. This is what exactly he had warned us long ago, and that's the reason why there should be finer uh, elements of life which should have a space in our educational system. And about Tagore, I would uh, remind you of the statement that Meghnath Shaha, the scientist, had made. And uh, he said, he began like this, in an age when art or writing was unknown or ill-developed, the poet's service to the community was far more valuable. The poet must say something in pithy, soul-stirring strains which the community would not allow to be forgotten. And then Saha continues and says, he sings of virtue and valor, of love and beauty, of sacrifice and splendor, and raises a picture which makes a lasting impression on the finer faculties of the youthful mind. He is the seer because he can see, he sees the, nature, the hidden secrets of nature. To be able to see this, you must be ready to accept what you see. You must, able, you must be able to question what you see. You must be able also to reason what you see and then imagine in your own way how exactly you would like to depict in both writing and painting and music. That's exactly what he did, which is why he says, everything comes to us that belongs to us if we create the capacity to receive it. This is my last, last slide, and I just wanted to quote as I end this presentation, uh, from Tagore, where he says, when I stand before thee at the day's end, thou shalt see my scars and know that I had my wounds and also my healing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Uday Narayan Singh, for that vicarious, wonderful journey into Tagore's Shantiniketan. I'm sure it brought back memories for some and invite others to visit very soon. Ram, 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 Ram,